Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Jamie Landers. Thank you for joining us. The Department of Justice announced they have opened a pattern or practice investigation into the Phoenix Police Department. This investigation will be led by the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division and will look into a number of issues. First, whether the Phoenix Police Department uses excessive force in violation of the Fourth Amendment. Second, whether the Phoenix Police Department engages in discriminatory policing practices that violate the Constitution and federal law. Third, whether the department violates the First Amendment by retaliating against individuals who are engaged in protected expressive activities. Fourth, whether the city and its police department respond to people with disabilities in a manner that violates the Americans with Disabilities Act. This includes whether decisions to criminally detain individuals with behavioral health disabilities are proper. And fifth, whether the Phoenix Police Department violates the rights of individuals experiencing homelessness by seizing and disposing of their belongings in a manner that violates the Constitution. Public reaction to the DOJ's announcement was mixed. Phoenix City officials like Mayor Kate Gallego and Vice Mayor Carlos Garcia, among others, applauded the move as a step in the right direction towards police accountability. The ACLU of Arizona was also in favor of the investigation, stating, quote, there is a clear need for fundamental change in the agency, and that starts with robust oversight and accountability. Other public officials like Council Members Ann O'Brien and Sal DeCicio were not happy about the announcement, saying the investigation would be harmful to the police department and its members. At the end of the day, we welcome anybody to take a look at our police department. We are completely transparent, and if the DOJ wants to take a look at it, they should be able to. But this has been nothing more than one more attack on our police department by the far leftist group, the ones that are pushing to defund the police movement, it's just giving them more fodder. Phoenix police say an Arizona state senator has been arrested on suspicion of charges accusing him of sexual conduct with a minor. Police said Democratic Senator Tony Navarrete of Phoenix was taken into custody on Thursday and booked into jail. Police say they received a report on Wednesday about sexual contact that allegedly occurred in 2019 and Navarrete was arrested after detectives interviewed a juvenile victim and witnesses. Navarrete did not immediately respond to requests for comment. More than 150 Arizona doctors are urging Governor Doug Ducey to mandate masks in public schools. The physicians dialed up pressure on the Republican governor Thursday as coronavirus cases rise and a growing number of school districts are requiring staff and students to wear masks. The doctors say in a letter that the highly contagious Delta variant of COVID-19 has changed the fight. They say scientists don't yet know the long-term effects of the coronavirus on developing brains. The legislature this year blocked schools from requiring masks, but at least six districts have done so anyway, noting the law doesn't start until the end of September. Families who were facing eviction are getting some relief. The CDC issued a new eviction ban this week. The agency says that kicking people out of their homes could be detrimental to public health. They also say it would interfere with efforts to contain the pandemic. The new rules cover areas with high or substantial transmission of COVID-19 and every county in Arizona falls under those categories. The eviction ban ends October 3rd. To stay competitive, retail giant Target will now pay 100% of college tuition, textbook costs, and fees for its full and part-time workers. It plans to spend $200 million over the next four years to offer its workers free undergraduate and associate degree programs, as well as certificates in business-oriented majors at select institutions, including the University of Arizona. Target stores across the valley are hiring thousands of positions. And now, a look back at some of our top sports stories. Two Los Angeles filmmakers made a revealing documentary about a Mexican family's migration to Santa Monica in the early 1900s. Cronkite News reporter Kimberly Silverio Bautista spoke with them about the historical issues and how it affects today's community. The largest Mexican migrant family, the Casillas, settled in the Pico neighborhood in 1918. They were limited to certain neighborhoods in L.A. along with the African-American and Asian community. 
Their experience reflects housing problems faced by many people of color in the Southwest who lived in segregated areas because of racially restrictive covenants. Because this was a multicultural neighborhood, it was the place where all the people of color lived. All the service workers, the janitors, the gardeners, the cooks, the, you know, the maids lived in this neighborhood. So it was, in, in many ways, it was defined by racism. Co-filmmaker Dan Kwong says, We Were All Here tells a story of the Casillas family in La Vente, which is what locals call 20th Street, in the Pico neighborhood in Santa Monica. Kwong said the family were delighted someone is interested in their story, although it was a challenge to interview them due to COVID-19 restrictions. So the early interviews had to be done by Zoom, which is very limiting, you know. Um, and one person I only interviewed couple only by phone um, so that was it, it, it made progress very difficult on the film because I couldn't say can I come over and look at all your old photographs right beyond housing segregation the construction of the Santa Monica 10 highway affected the neighborhoods residents were displaced across the LA communities of color co-filmmaker Paulina Sahagan said this neighborhood was thriving even before the highway was built. Sahagan would like city planners to be more cautious of structures they plan to build before destroying a neighborhood. Really look at this. Urban planners, really look at this. See what you have already. It's kind of like ripping out native plants and putting plants that don't grow in that medium. So what will happen? You'll have a disaster. In Santa Monica, Kimberly Silveri Bautista, Cronkite News. The filmmakers hope to develop the film for educational purposes in the future. Their film premiered in Santa Monica on Saturday, June 26. This Pride Month, many athletes and athletic organizations have called for more LGBTQ acceptance in sport. In Phoenix, one adult recreational league is doing the same. I was able to speak with the league and some of its members to see what they are doing to increase local participation and inclusivity in sports. Nolan Newsom's height and stature always made him seem like the perfect athlete, but sports were a place he felt he didn't belong growing up gay. I'm six foot six, so I played basketball naturally. Everyone asked me that and it was fun. I loved it, but I truly felt discluded. Um, and not involved and it made me, you know, depressed and not, not passionate about it. Newsom is not alone. Athletics are a place where many members of the LGBTQ community feel they have traditionally been barred. And so the Varsity Gay League was created to change these perceptions. One of the things that we really strive to create is a culture that is accepting and open, especially to people who might not have felt that they were athletic or thought they would ever be athletic. The Varsity Gay League oversees more than 200 different sports leagues across the nation. In Phoenix, they offer dodgeball, kickball, and doubles tennis. And you don't have to be gay to play. Though the league is specifically marketed to increase LGBTQ participation in sport, another goal is to increase allyship. We want straight people to come and play with us and, you know, get to know us. We're just people and we want to be visible and be accepted and be part of the community. Both Kevin Bouchaw and Will Hackner, the creator of the organization, say the Varsity Gay League has improved the visibility and camaraderie of the gay community in Phoenix. They have a space, a large open space, where teams and communities and people and events and activities and, you know, all of that is brought together in a supportive way has created such a loving, beautiful culture. The Varsity Gay League is continuing to expand. As participation grows in Phoenix, more sports and teams will be added to the league. If you want to play in the Varsity Gay League, visit their website at varsitygayleague.com slash phoenix for more information. COVID-19 has taken a major toll on small business across America with the Federal Reserve estimating over 200,000 closures across the country. Cronkite News reporter Harrison Klopp has the story of one small business in downtown Phoenix that was closed, but managed to reopen, rebrand, and succeed. Searcher is a skate shop located on Roosevelt Row in downtown Phoenix that sells anything from skateboards, clothes, and art. However, 
they didn't always used to be a skate shop. From June of 2019 to March of 2020, Searcher was an art gallery. But when the pandemic started, the gallery closed. However, owners TJ Brendel, Becky Bays, and Grant Oberlin saw the pandemic as a fresh start to rebrand their company. You know, people coming for like to buy art, like it's really hard to have people come in, especially after COVID, and spend $300 on like an original piece of artwork. So basically what we were trying to do is like make something that, you know, people need, people want. I mean, the skaters need supplies, they need wheels, they need trucks, they need bearings. People like buying shirts. The COVID was actually a blessing in disguise for us. We had the space, it was empty because of COVID, and we decided to do something, you know, once everything kind of was about to go back to normal or whatever, we were like, we should do something that we've always wanted to do. And for us, it was actually a good thing. We open up and we just kick it and it doesn't feel like work, which is the best thing possible. So it's just me, Tim and Becky out here every evening, just grinding away, coming up with new ideas, shooting ideas back and forth from each other. And while Searcher has only been open since February, they've already seen success, staying open with a different business model and with foot traffic. The, the response has been amazing. I think we went into this with uh, really low expectations, you know, opening a brick and mortar retail store in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> probably not the best idea ever, you know, but honestly, I think a lot of people um, have come through here and just the, the, the response has been really positive. I think a lot of people come through here and they really just like the vibe, you know, it's, it's very chill and we have stuff that people need or want. And, uh, you know, to be able to offer that to our community that we live in and and we support local as much as we possibly can, so we really appreciate everyone coming in here and doing that as well. In Phoenix, Harrison Klopp, Cronkite News. Right now, the skate shop is continuing to do business on Roosevelt Row, but would like to open more locations in the future. Another Suns watch party was held for Game 4 of the NBA Finals last night, but it wasn't held at the Phoenix Suns Arena. This time, fans gathered at Chase Field. Emily Carmen has more on the event and the experience of watching a basketball game in a baseball stadium. Thousands of fans descended on Chase Field Wednesday night, but it wasn't for a Diamondbacks game. The fans came to cheer on the Phoenix Suns during game four of the NBA Finals. It's gonna be as if the Suns were actually here, like just fans being excited, probably jumping all over the place. The Suns originally announced there would be no watch party for game four, so the Diamondbacks offered to host the event since the team is off for the All-Star break. Though some fans thought the location was strange, they were still excited to go cheer on the Suns. It's a little odd, it's a little odd, but I mean, I love basketball, so I'll watch it anywhere. We can watch it on a golf course while I care. Chase Field normally seats around 50,000, so many people were expecting there to be a lot of fans here for the watch party, more than usual. But that's not so much the case. The Diamondbacks only sold 15,000. That's one 5,000 tickets for this event. But the Phoenix Suns Arena sits around 18,000. Nonetheless, fans say they are really excited to be watching the basketball game here at the baseball stadium. If you can pull 10,000 people together to watch a game that isn't even in front of you, they're, they're going to be some dedicated fans, so it'll be a good time. Though the Suns lost game four and fans emptied the stadium with the disappointed faces, many said they had a great time at the event. When you watch it at home, it's like not the field, but then with this, it was amazing. And that they still believe the Suns will prevail in the end. I'm a little upset, but it's okay. We'll come back and we'll persevere. It's okay. The Suns return to Phoenix Suns Arena for game five of the finals on Saturday. In Phoenix, Emily Carmen, Cronkite News. Tickets for Game 5 are already on sale, but they are expensive, between $800 and $1,000 for upper-level seats. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for Break It Down. We're talking about how politics have affected hesitancy of the COVID-19 vaccine. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.